Hello, and welcome back to Gunfighter Life. Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Psalm 144. Welcome to, or back to, the podcast where we come at gunfighting from a Judeo-Christian ethical moral worldview, from a real-world, first-hand perspective. Before we get into the bio, if you'd like to skip it, you can skip to around three, three and a half minutes in and you should end up in a topic or pretty close to it. Who I am? First and foremost, I am a Christian. I make no apologies for that. I grew up in the South, Southeast United States, what most would consider poor. Grew up hunting and fishing and shooting at a very early age. I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I did combat tours, plural, in Iraq. After that, I was an urban warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps. After the Marine Corps time, I went to work for LAPD, where I worked regular assignments and more specialized assignments. I've also been a private contractor for the federal government. I've also served the United States Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. I have been a state rifle and pistol champion in a few different states a few different times over. I started shooting shooting competitions even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I am very blessed to have all those talents, and I am very blessed that God got me through everything that he's gotten me through alive and in one piece and made it back safely when a lot of other good men did not. Not because of anything that I am, but because of who God has made me and because of how much God has protected me and sheltered me. I have served as the commander of a tactical team, in a large metropolitan area where our primary job is to stock active shooters. I've hunted and fished all over this beautiful country. Everything from whitetail on the east coast and mule deer on the west coast and elk and bear and wolf and exotics and buffalo. I've been a professional hunter and guide. Professional firearms instructor, FBI certified. NRA certified, other three-letter government agency certified, professional firearms instructor for a lot of years. And as I mentioned first, the most alpha thing about me is I am a follower of Jesus Christ, the ultimate alpha male. With that being said, we'll get into today's topic. Before we get into today's topic, I just want to remind you that the battle is the Lord's, and the Lord is a warrior, Exodus 15. Whatever battle you fight, make sure you're on the right side. Make sure you're fighting for good. If God is for you, what can stand against you, the Bible says. If the God of angel armies is on your side, what shall you fear? The battle is the Lord's. And if God is on your side, the battle is already won. Look at Samson. He fought with just the jawbone of a donkey. But Jesus told his disciples in the Gospel of Luke, If you don't have a sword, sell your garment and buy one. So, so also we see David, a man after God's own heart. He starts off with a sling and a stone, fighting against Goliath. And you know what? He knew how to use that sling and stone. He had hunted with it, he had practiced with it, he had defended his flock with it. However you want to consider that as training. And not only that, but several times we see in the Bible, God's angels armed with swords. We see, going back to David, David lifted up his eyes and saw an angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth with a drawn sword in his hand. So if Jesus tells his disciples to get a sword, and we see David armed, and we see God's own angels carrying swords, it may not be popular in whatever culture, but I'm here to tell you there's no contradiction with being a strong, dominant warrior who's armed and being a man of God. David was a man after God's own heart, and David was armed. David was a great warrior. 
With that, guys, let's get into today's topic. We are going to talk about combat handguns. And mostly combat handguns of the United States. We might go down a rabbit hole, one or two short little rabbit holes. But we're mostly talking about combat handguns of the United States. Is there, I didn't plan this out, but is there a better analogy for a modern sling and a stone than a handgun? All right, guys, let's start off with the what I would consider the first modern, still viable combat handgun. The 1911. One very near and dear to me because that's kind of the platform that my combat handguns are based on. I have a very nice Colt Combat Elite, but my go to combat handgun, fighting handgun, is an STI. I have two of them, but STI 2011s. I really like the Marauder that I have. It is a fine, fine pistol. If there's a better pistol out there, combat handgun, I haven't found it. And that's based on the 1911. The 1911 really is an amazing design. It is a combat handgun. It is a fighting handgun. It's not a badge of rank or honor like a lot of the European countries had um, during that time, you know, in World War I and before. It is a fighting pistol. It is a workhorse. It was literally designed in cavalry days when men were riding horses. And it's still with us, and it's still a good, effective combat handgun. I I really wish that more guns had that kind of trigger, that straight back, flat, straight to the rear trigger. It just, it's marvelous. There's two things about accuracy with a handgun. One is the mechanical accuracy of the handgun, which a 1911 certainly can have. And one is the shooter's ability to shoot it accurately. The ability of a shooter to translate his skill into accuracy in that pistol. And the 1911, in my opinion, does that better than any other pistol. I use the analogy. And another wrong, we'll get into Glocks too, and I own Glocks. But a Glock trigger I've heard described as dragging a piano down a dirt road. I don't know who first said that, but it's a great analogy. The 1911 trigger is like a small glass rod breaking. It just breaks all at once, and it's clean, and it's wonderful. In fact, the gun that I probably pull the trigger on the most is a 1911 because I like the trigger. My dry firing, I do a lot of dry firing with that Colt Combat Elite. It's got a heavy trigger, but it's got a very nice trigger. It's got a very hard wall and a very clean break. It is a fantastic combat handgun. The 1911 obviously first came in the 45 ACP, and nobody's going to argue that that's an effective combat handgun round. I would say today with modern bullet technology, the 9mm is where it's at. And I'm not jumping on the bag and wagon, guys. When I was a police officer, I switched to 9mm back when everybody, not everybody, back when the vast majority of people were still thinking 40 was the hot thing. And I started shooting competition and I quickly realized shot placement is to me was far more important. And I switched to the nine millimeter long before it was the craze, long before the FBI switched back to it. I am an FBI certified firearms instructor. I don't know why it took them so long, but uh, I would say the nine millimeter is where it's at. And there's nothing heretical about, in my opinion, some people may disagree. Some people are very passionate about their 1911s, but there's nothing heretical about having a 1911 and a nine millimeter. My STIs are double stacked. My Marauder came with, you know, 21 round mags, 9 millimeter, And I don't know how they do it, um, but it doesn't feel really any bigger than a standard 1911. And I believe it's lighter. Even my full size STI Marauder, which I don't make anymore, is lighter, I believe, than my Colt Combat Elite that holds 7 rounds. Now it holds 21 rounds of 9 millimeter. Moving on. From the 1911, we get into the Beretta 92. And if I have to pick an issued, obviously I like my STI 2011s better for me, but if I have to get into an issued military or police combat handgun, I think the Beretta is the finest issued combat handgun ever. I said it. 
especially for the STI is a great gun, but it is like a Ferrari. It takes maintenance. It takes upkeep. It takes, takes know-how. The Beretta gives you a lot of that elegance and shootability I talked about with the 1911 that makes it great, but it's a rugged design. It is combat proven. I carried one in Iraq along with uh, an M16. I had a catastrophic failure, meaning that I was not able to be fixed by the user failure with my M16 during the war. I never had any issues with my Beretta 92. I know they did have some issues early on, but a lot of that, if you research it, had to do with shooting improper ammo that the gun wasn't meant to shoot. So I wouldn't really fault the Beretta for that. It is a fine handgun. It is ridiculously accurate. I have a Wilson Combat Beretta 92G. That is my one criticism of the regular Beretta 92 in that it, in its military guise, has a slide-mounted safety decocker. You can very easily convert that to what's called the G model or the Type G, where it's a decocker only. Because you don't want to have a dead trigger if you need to use that gun and you're not anticipating it. So the G model with the decocker only, that is one small criticism, but it's an easy correction to do. It is accurate. It is beautiful. It is elegant. It is, a, in my opinion, the finest issued to our military combat handgun. Little story. When I was in the Marine Corps, I thought, especially getting out of the Marine Corps, I thought, you know, there must be much better handguns that thing. Because the one I had in the Marine Corps is all beat up and a lot of the bluing worn off and who knows how old it was or how many rounds it had through. And I thought there had to be something better. And I, you know, went to be a police officer, carried a, quite a few different guns, a SIG, Series, you know, Glocks. Um, you know, I was a full-time firearms instructor, head firearms instructor for a facility. On my lunch, I had access to a lot of different handguns under the counter. And I would go and shoot them on my lunch. And I would try and cycle through them. I can't say that I shot every one, but I shot a lot of the, you know, modern handguns of the time. And I'll be darned if I didn't shoot the Beretta better than all of them. At least all the ones I can remember shooting. And I thought, this can't be right. And I went back to it. And sure enough, you know, that Beretta, it's just a remarkably accurate gun. It's amazingly accurate. It's got a fine trigger. You know, I've carried a double action, single action uh, what they call double action revolver with a long heavy trigger pull. So the first long heavy trigger pull of the Beretta I don't see as a detriment. In fact, in a combat gun, I kind of see it as a plus. Um, I really like that. I think it's superior to I know the new hot thing is striker fire, but I really think that single action trigger pull when you want it is a great thing to have. I think the shootability and the accuracy and the reliability of the Beretta, um, I know it's kind of not in vogue right now. It's kind of one of those pistols people look over for the newer hotter things but i think the beretta is a fine combat handgun i think it will be for decades to come especially uh with the newer models coming out they have some single action only models that are amazing um like i said my wilson combat beretta 92g i have some sti 2011s and they are fantastic in my everyday you know as a professional gunfighter go-to handgun that's it but if I was picking like an end of the world apocalypse, one of my handguns, it would probably be, mm, I, I'd be hard pressed, but it would be very likely, I don't know if I could pick between the two, but if I had to pick one, it might be the Beretta 92G because it is a more rugged, simpler design than a 1911. It's got, you know, a more rugged design. It's a little bit simpler and it's great. It's a great shooter. If you're a new shooter, this may not apply to you, and I'm not bragging. You heard a little bit about my bio. I've been very blessed with talents, and I've won more shooting competitions than I can remember. And I shot Glocks for quite a while as a police officer. I still own Glocks and shoot Glocks, especially when I train with my guys, because I want them to see that I can shoot you know, any handgun well, because a lot of my guys carry Glocks. It's you know the Honda Civic of the handgun world. So I bring that out from time to time, especially during training. But I got to the point where I... I could outshoot a Glock, I could outrun the trigger, and I could shoot more accurately than those Glocks could shoot, and I could run a gun fast, and I couldn't manipulate those controls as fast as I could with other guns. And that Beretta, it just, it's accurate, it's elegant, it, the recoil impulse on it is fantastic, especially with the Brigadier models, uh, like the Wilson Combat one. Just an amazing handgun. And it's Italian, 
and a lot of them are made in Maryland in America. And if you can't tell by my last name, my family comes from Italy, and I was born in Maryland, so also pretty cool. But anyway, it's just a beautiful design. It's an elegant and rugged and accurate handgun, and that's a hard thing to put all those things together. Um, and just a fantastic handgun. And right now, like I said, they're not really coveted, so you can find them pretty easily. Well, I'm talking maybe not in the ammo gun apocalypse of 2020, 2021, but generally you can find them on the used market trade-ins. People want to trade them for newer, hotter things. Um, but if you can get one, the only modification you really need to make, I think, to make it a very good combat handgun is to put the the G conversion in it to make it a decocker only. Um, and that's about it. If you can get the whatever it is, the A1 model or one of the newer ones with the light rail if you want that. I don't generally run lights on my handguns. Uh, it makes them a little bit bigger and bulkier. But I run the Blackhawk Omnivore holster for most of my handguns because it'll take any light with a rail with an adapter. And that's what I run, and that's why I'm suggesting that to you. You'll never regret not having a rail. But if you get a good price on just a regular 92, and uh, I would suggest that it is a very good value in handguns for what they generally cost on the market. I can't speak for today's prices. Now, let's get into the handgun that lost the main contract to the Beretta 92. And I, am, I, I might disagree with a lot of people in that I think that the military at that time made the right choice in picking the Beretta 92. I think it's a better design. I have run both. I carried the SIG, which is the handgun we're talking about, that lost the contract, the SIG P229 and the 226. I forget when they submitted to the handgun trials. Basically the same gun. One's a little bit shorter. The 226 and the 229. They were used and are still used, I believe, by some different more specialized areas of the military. I ran one as a police officer. It is a fine combat handgun. Again, double single action. It has a very good single action trigger. It comes out of the box. Like I said, the Beretta should be with the decocker only, meaning that you have a slide or a frame mounted control that decocks the hammer, but it doesn't put the weapon on safe. That's a good thing. Um, the thing that I don't really like about them is that they have a very high bore axis. And like I said, when you learn to shoot fast like really fast that high bore axis at least for me makes a difference also the grips tend to run a little bit big and so do the berettas but the bretta has a better trigger reach for me like i don't have giant hands and i can reach a trigger much better when the hammer's back than i remember being able to do on the sig series handguns but the sig 226 229 are also a fine combat handgun also, lesser known, I mentioned on an earlier podcast, but the SIG, I believe 2022 is their polymer frame basic copy of that. And they were never that well liked. I don't think they still make them, but if you can find one, they're generally not super expensive. Um, so you're looking for to get into that world and not spend as much money if you just like the SIG 2, 220 series, 226, 229s, whatever the military designation is, the M11. You know, don't shy away from those. They also make... Uh, I don't think it was adopted by our military, but it was used in other military roles. The SIG 220, which is in a 45, single stack 45, kind of like the 1911. If I had to pick, I'd go with the 1911, but it's a fine combat handgun. The SIG 220, the 226, the 229, they came in 9s, 40s, and 357 SIG. It would be a pretty sweet to have one at 357 SIG, I'm not going to lie. I never ran one in the military, but I did run one as a police officer. It was an issued duty weapon for me for a time. The SIG 229 in 40 Smith & Wesson. Maybe the fact that it was in a 40 Smith & Wesson was the reason I didn't like it that much. I carried my own. Uh, I went from that to carrying my own. I tried the Glock 21. I quickly realized it was um, too big for my hands. I could shoot it well, but I couldn't run the controls well. And I couldn't shoot as well as I could shoot a 9mm. And I like the 45, but shot placement is far more important. So I went to a Smith & Wesson M&P 9mm. But anyway, a little bit out of a rabbit hole. But that SIG 226, 229, it's, it's proven itself to be reliable. It's rugged. Um, there's some things I don't like about it, but it's definitely an effective combat handgun. A little side note, I'll mention the Mark 23, which is like a giant HK USB. I have minimal experience with these. 
they're very cool guns. They are what I believe was the only designated offensive handgun for the U.S. military. But they are gigantic. Like I mentioned before, I'm a I wear a medium sized glove generally. Like I, that is, you have to have big hands, I think, to run that gun effectively. It is a big double stack forty five. Much bigger than, let's say, much bigger in grip, I believe, than my STI 2011s, which I run very well. Um, so the Mark 23, it's like an offensive combat handgun. It is huge. But if you're a big dude with big hands and you want to run a big gun, double stack 45, look into that Mark 23. I did run in competition very early on in HK USP Expert in 45 until I quickly realized that uh, 45 is expensive to shoot and to reload for. But the HK USP expert, the HK, um, I guess you consider it a combat handgun. I don't know that our military has ever adopted it, um, but a lot of police forces have, so I'll throw that in there. But we did adopt, uh, at least for specialized roles, the Mark 23, which is basically a really big HK USP. There might be some internal differences, um, but the Mark 23 by HK is definitely a combat handgun. And we'll talk about the last adopted combat handgun general issue for the U.S. military, the M17. Before it was the M17, it was the 320. Now, I had some experience with a very early 320 when it, I don't want to say first came out, but it was pretty new when I got several of them um, given to me as a professional firearms instructor with the facility that I trained with. It was not something I went out and saw it, but it was something that was provided to me. Um, I was not very impressed with them. I'm still not super impressed with them. I've toyed around with the idea because they're so modular of getting one and playing around with them. Um, I, as opposed to the Beretta trials, I don't think I wouldn't have made this choice if I were in charge of acquiring handguns for the U S military. I think they made the right choice with the Beretta, but I think mm, I, if it were me, I would have went with the Glock. Like I said, I cannot run a Glock. I cannot shoot a standard out-of-the-box Glock. I'm very blessed, but your general-purpose grunt soldier does not spend a lot of time behind a handgun. It's not their fault. They just don't. And I think the Glock is very well proven. Talking about combat handguns, the Glock has been used by some special forces units. It's definitely been used by a ton of law enforcement and military um, so I probably would have went with that instead of the 320 designated the M17. Like I said, I've never been super big fan of them. I know that they had some issues with dropping and going off. Not the military version, but I, but uh, the early, the earlier civilian versions of them. Anyway, it is cool that they're modular, but to the average soldier, at least I was in the Marine Corps. I was in the Army. I can't see the Army like issuing a soldier a kit with a bunch of different grips and be like, oh, here you go, Private. Which one do you like the best? Which one fits your hands the best? They're going to get what they're given. So the fact that it's modular, I'm not sure is a big plus, at least for the military. If you're a civilian and you have like, you want to have one handgun or one thing and you want to play with it and you're the kind of guy that always likes to change things and, and mess with things, I get that. It's cool. I like tinkering with guns too. Um, if you want to take a Dremel to the frame and if you mess it up, you're out 50 bucks and you get a new one. There are some pluses to it. Um, but it is the new issued combat handgun for the military, for the U S military. It's a double stack nine millimeter. It, uh, it's very good capacity. Nothing wrong with that. The military version has a slide mount of safety, hearkening back to very similar to the 1911 we talked about. It's a striker fired polymer pistol. And I'm not going to say it's a bad handgun. It's a perfectly serviceable combat handgun. And talking about that, I don't know how I missed it, but going back to the 1911, the Marines recently, up until very recently, re-went with, re-went with, they got some more. They still use a Breda, the Marine Corps, as their main handgun, but some of their more specialized guys went back to a 1911. The Colt designated the M45, and those things are freaking sweet. I saw one at a gun store not super long ago before all the craziness got super apocalyptic with the guns and the ammo and i wish i had bought it because it was pretty cool and i'm not a gun collector i would have shot it but it would be a good gun for an investment and it would just be cool to have and i probably would carry it and use it but the 
talking about combat handguns, that Colt M45. They also make one you might be able to find cheaper or not as collectible. Um, is I think the CQB model. I think they call it the CQB. I really like my Colt Combat Elite. Anyway, we're getting down a rabbit hole, guys. I'll give honorable mention to a few. I obviously, I couldn't mention every country's combat handguns because that would be way longer than a podcast. I could do a whole separate podcast on combat handguns. But I will give honorable mention to the CZ-75 and all its clones and all its platforms. It's an amazing design. Obviously, the U.S. military never used it. But uh, it is an amazing design, the CZ-75. So if you want something a little bit different, it's definitely a great combat handgun. Whatever derivative, I'm not even, I I don't know how many different makes and models they have of the CZ-75. Well, models anyway. There's other companies that clone them. But there's a ton of different kinds. Anything from competition to concealed carry. It's a great handgun. An honorable mention, I know the 1911 was adopted by us in obviously 1911. But the Luger, I've only shot like an old Luger once, but I was making, you know, headshots on a head plate at 25 yards consistently. It is a very good handgun. It's very complex in the way that it works and everything, but it it does function. It is semi-automatic, so I will give a uh, little bit of recognition. It did beat the 1911 to the table. It is a 9mm, which has become the prominent you know combat handgun round and the luger did that way back at the turn of the century well over 100 years ago and it was semi-automatic um it's got kind of a funky grip angle but it's a very good pistol especially for its day is it still modern and relevant like the 1911 i would say no but i give it a shout out it's a cool gun all right guys before we uh conclude the podcast i want to remind you to like subscribe and comment to the podcast Help others find it if you liked it. If you like this podcast, you may like a few others. You can find them all at goodshepherdtraining.com. Also do the Alpha Male Podcast. Helping each other be strong, dominant alpha males like we're made to be by our Creator and our Savior. You all may also like Simple Man Sermons if you want you know, more of the spiritual important end. Simple Man Sermons. Like I said, you can find all those at goodshepherdtraining.com. You can find those podcasts. Just look them up by the name on whatever platform you're listening to this on. They're probably on there as well. You can find Good Shepherd Training on Instagram and on Facebook. If you'd like to support financially, you can go to Good Shepherd Training on Patreon. So go to Patreon, type in Good Shepherd Training. If you think this podcast or a bunch of the podcasts you've listened to are worth a dollar and you want to help You can contribute a dollar or more. If you have it in your heart to give, give. And if not, don't and don't feel guilty about it. My God supplies all my needs. And on that note, uh, we'll close with uh, Psalm 144. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Thanks and have a blessed day.